I'm sure each of us, when we've gone through certain things in life, when we've faced difficulties or challenges, if you're anything like me, then you go through that situation trying to figure out how will this work for my good. We want details. God, if you're going to make a way out for me, how exactly are you going to do it? At precisely what time will you come to my rescue? How long will I have to go through this before things actually start turning around for my good? And I would assume that we all believe in the word of God. But in that moment, when things are tough, it's not always easy. I know I've been to that place where you say, God, I know in Romans 8, 28, it says for, we know all things work together for the good of them that loved the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And if things work out for my good, I'm confused about why this situation is taking place. I'm confused about why this is happening to me right now. Nothing was going the way I wanted already, and then this takes place? If you've ever been in this situation, and I imagine Job must have felt like this, I imagine Joseph must have mentally reached this place at some point, trying to figure out how exactly is the fact that my brothers betrayed me going to work for my good? He must have some point asked God, how exactly is me in prison going to end up working for my good? And I want to speak to you if you've been there, or if perhaps this sounds like your present circumstances, where you feel like you're being held captive and you feel like you can't get out of that rut. You feel like you can't move past that situation. If you do feel like this, then I would urge you to perhaps stop and think. Could the Lord have placed you there for a specific reason? For a specific purpose? A purpose such as exposing the gifts really hidden inside of you. A purpose such as unlocking the faith that's covered by a comfortable life. But oftentimes, because we're focusing on the negative, we don't see the positive in that situation, and we don't see what God is trying to do. Could it be that the reason for this difficulty is God wanting to reveal to you how real He is? That He is the great I Am. That Jesus Christ still can perform miracles on this earth today. See, if we learn how to change our perspective, if we learn to walk by faith and not by sight, if we open our spiritual eyes and change the way that we see things, then our mind truly changes. As a man thinks, so is he, the Bible says. So what happens when instead of asking, when will things turn around for my good? We start asking, what do you want me to learn in this, Lord? What happens if, instead of speaking about the negative only, I begin to think on those good things that are promised in the Bible. If I begin to think on all those great things, even though I feel like everything is going wrong in my life, imagine how uplifting that will be in your faith. I can look at the fact that I know who I have in my corner. I know his power. I know that he who is in me is greater than he who is in the world. All I have to do is call out to Jesus and he's right there with me. Because the Bible tells us that the Lord is a stronghold, a very present help in the time of trouble. But the unfortunate thing with many believers is that during a storm in their life, they're so focused on the clouds being great. They're so focused on the thunder and lightning, so focused on the rough waters tossing us to and fro that we forget who is on that boat with us. We forget that the one who is on the boat with us has the keys to death, hell, and the grave. And this is not to overlook anyone's situation. There are difficult things that people go through, and I know it may be very hard sometimes, but I'd like to encourage you to change your mindset, shift your perspective, activate your faith, and see that the Lord wants to get the glory out of your life. He wants His glory to be able to shine off of you. Your trial will be a testimony for others to see how they can make it too. And the word I'd like to give you is that you're already equipped with what you need in order to survive this. 
you're already equipped with what you need in order to overcome this. You have what it takes. You have more than enough. So start declaring that you're an overcomer. You're more than a conqueror. Your physical eyes might not see it yet, but activate your spiritual eyes and declare God's word, which says that I've overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of my testimony. There's power in the blood of Jesus, and His plans are for you to prosper. They are plans which are good to give you a hope and a future because you are that important to God. Begin to see the worth in your life through God's word. God is trying to tell you, yes, you are that important. You can overcome if you hold on to me, if you hold on to my word and promises. This storm you're facing could be God's word saying to you, I need you to go through this for a specific reason and for this specific season. So before you go anywhere else searching for solutions, before you look elsewhere for answers, in Jesus, you have someone who moves mountains, a God who performs miracles, a God who can make a way when there seems to be no way. Nothing is impossible with God. There are times when you simply need to read and immerse yourself in the Word of God. And I'm talking about the times when a sermon won't do, a word of encouragement won't do it, but you simply need to hear from God Himself through His Word. And so today, I pray that as I read these scriptures, God's Spirit would begin to move in your heart, your mind and soul, and stir up your faith. I pray that these scriptures would find you wherever you may be, in whatever situation you're in, and they would remind you that the Lord still cares. The Lord still loves you, and His promises still stand true. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 to 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. I want you to take away a few things from this passage. Our God is a God who has and shows compassion. He is a God who has given us the wonderful Holy Spirit to comfort us in all our trials and troubles. So what you face may be painful, yes, it may be unpleasant, but one thing remains true according to the Word of God, and that is the fact that we serve a compassionate and loving God, one who comforts us in all our troubles. Further scriptures worth meditating are on Romans 15, 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I like how the psalmist here says, even though. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, He might as well have said, it doesn't matter where I walk. Even though it looks bad, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Even though it seems like there's no hope, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Even though it appears to be over, I will fear no evil because you are with me. We need to be people who have this kind of faith. People that have even though kind of faith because when all is said and done, Jesus Christ is with us. And if God be with us, who, who can be against us? Furthermore, Romans 8 verse 28 says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God 
to those who are the called according to his purpose. You see, all of these scriptures, there are many more in the Bible, but all of these scriptures tell you in different ways that God cares for you. God cares about you. God is looking out for you. God is working things out in your favor. God will order your steps. And I pray that the Lord would open the ears of someone who needs to hear this, someone who perhaps has a heavy heart or a broken heart. To that person, I want to say, look to Jesus. Have faith in Jesus. Hold on to Jesus Christ of Nazareth and he will surely see you through. Christ and Christ alone is the rock upon which we stand. The gospel of Jesus Christ is all about repentance, turning away from sin, loving God with all your heart and soul and mind. The gospel of Christ is what we believe in. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's the gospel we believe as Christians. So guard your heart every day. Proverbs 4 verse 23 says, Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. You have a spiritual heart. The Bible uses this term, the heart, in a spiritual sense to refer to the real part of us, the very inner part of you, which is our soul, our spirit, our mind, all wrapped up in this concept of the heart. So what goes on in your heart affects the world around you. Out of the heart spring the issues, the issues of life. Do you have an issue with anger? Look at your heart. Do you have an issue with self-control? An issue with gambling? Do you keep cycling in and out of the same sin? Well, it's a hard issue. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life, the Bible says. The issues of life are heart issues. So think twice before blaming your husband or wife. What's really going on in your heart? What is really affecting your marriage and your relationships and your finances? So do what you have to. We are the gatekeepers of our physical hearts and spiritual hearts. So guard it, protect it, keep your heart and nurture your heart for it is the wellspring of life. And throughout the scripture, we read about the importance of our hearts and the condition, the spiritual condition of our hearts. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 16, 7, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. We look at the outward appearance. We look at the suit, the dress. We look at the hair, if they have any swagger about them. We unfortunately make too many judgments and opinions based on the observation of our physical eyes. However, God goes beyond that. He's concerned with the state of the heart. Matthew 15 verse 8 says, These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So you can say the right things. You can speak in the right kind of manner all you want but it's not prayer until you give God all of your heart, soul, and mind. We've all had to contend with uncertainty at one time or another in our lives. And you can only be one of two camps. You can be in the camp that houses fear, anxiety, stress, and worry. Or you can be in the camp that trusts in the Lord, the camp that trusts in God's promises. Because when you face uncertainty, you can either worry about it or trust God about it. And I believe right now in this day and age, if you look at current affairs, there are plenty of reasons for people to be worried and anxious, and it's all because so many things are uncertain. There's uncertainty when it comes to the economy. There's uncertainty 
when it comes to world peace. There's uncertainty in so many areas. But here's the thing. Here's what the Bible says in Matthew 6, verses 31 through 34. Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And so when you face this old adversary called uncertainty, remember that God is in control. Remember that Jesus Christ is with you, and if he is with you, who can be against you? When uncertainty comes, remember that although we may not know what tomorrow holds, Jesus Christ does. Remember that although we don't know what tomorrow holds, we know who holds tomorrow. Although we don't know what threats, what enemies, what problems we'll encounter in the future. Jesus Christ is now and will always be a provider. He is and will always be an almighty protector. Saints, I want to encourage you to trust in the God who does know. Trust in the Almighty. Trust in the Omniscient One. What is unknown to us is known to Him. What is uncertain to us is already certain to him. He knows all. He orchestrates it all. He's planned it all so that everything will work out for your good in the end. Hold on to what Psalm 91 verses 14 and 15 say. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. If and when uncertainty comes to you, remember that Jesus Christ is watching over you. He is the one to guide you. Our God will be the one to lift you up when you fall. He will preserve you during times of uncertainty. He will keep you in his loving arms. He will give his angels charge over you. He is a God that will protect you so that no misfortune may befall you. Our hearts can be so fickle. We chase whatever we think will satisfy us at any given moment. Our desires are here one day and gone the next. The problem with our hearts is that our priorities are often in the wrong place. We tend to get distracted by worldly things, things like money, power, and relationships, things that aren't even necessarily evil, but can quickly become idols in our lives. We give them too much control. We give them permission to rule our lives, thinking they'll fulfill us, but they never quite deliver what they promise. Thankfully, there's a better way to live. There's a better king to rule our hearts, God. He is the only one who can fulfill us and satisfy us and give us everything we need. And he is worth pursuing above everything else. Keep God first, and you will lack for nothing. Let him rearrange your priorities, and he will rearrange your life. Give God the throne to your heart and he will change your desires and enable you to be truly satisfied in him. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? 
That's Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Take a minute to just think about that for a second. The heart, not your mind, not anything else, but the heart. The part of you where emotions and desires begin. The heart, the part of you that drives your will and leads you to act. The Bible is clear here that there is greater wickedness in our hearts by nature than we ourselves are aware of. So brothers and sisters, be warned by this verse in Jeremiah 17, 9. Don't fall under the false belief that your own heart is pure and better than it really is. The heart of man, according to the Bible, is in a fallen state. It's false and deceitful above all things. Take a moment to think about what's important in the grand scheme of things. Everything on this earth is temporary and fleeting. None of it will last. But God's kingdom will never end. For that reason, He is the only one worthy of our devotion. He is the only one we should be focused on, no matter what everyone else is doing. Keep God first. No matter what season of life you're in, keep God first. Because the treasures of this earth are passing away, all of our earthly pursuits will let us down in the end. So store up your treasure in heaven where nothing can be destroyed. Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God and the rest will be added to you. He will provide for your every need from the basics like food and clothing to our soul's deepest longings for love and affection. If you place faith in man, you will be disappointed. But if you trust in God, you will be rewarded. So what does it mean to keep God first? The first step is to make that conscious decision to devote your life to the things that matter. Strive to live for the glory of God. Live to love God and to love your neighbor. Meditate on His Word all day long. Honor Him with your words and with your actions. Always be seeking to grow in your walk with Him, because that, above all else, is what our souls long for. These worldly pursuits demand so much of our time and energy. They enslave us. But Jesus comes to set us free. He comes to bring us rest. So pray for God to tear down every idol, to break down every barrier keeping you from Him. Don't be consumed by worry or fear, but trust in all His promises. Because when you keep God first, He will take care of the rest. Let's talk about David. David is described as a man after God's own heart. Can you imagine that? David is someone who was fully devoted to God in his heart. Yes, David fell short. Yes, he sinned. But boy, let me tell you something. David had a willing heart. And this is one of the reasons that I really love to read the Psalms, because so often the heart is mentioned. Consider the following scriptures. Psalm 19, verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Psalm 26, verse 2. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my mind and my heart. Psalm 51, verse 10. 
Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And so, dear listener, let me ask you, how's your heart today? What does your heart love? Who does your heart love? What is your heart willing to do for the Lord? A willing heart is a heart that wants to. So, in a way you could say, God loves a heart that wants to chase after him. A heart that wants to seek his presence. God loves a heart that wants to serve him and be used for his glory. You see, if we think about it, our hearts can so often be filled with many many things, many passions, many desires, many goals and plans. But how much of what is in your heart can be described as a willingness to seek God? Too often, I've seen people lay the blame for their failures on the devil, when in all actuality, the root issue was that they never had a willingness to seek God or obey his word. And so that left them exposed to the enemy. Too many people put the blame on their circumstances or they want to blame it on their past or even on other people. But if you really get to the bottom line, their issue is a heart issue. They have no willingness. They have no want to. Their heart isn't willing to be led by the good shepherd. Their heart's not willing to repent and turn away from sin. And let me tell you, a heart that's not willing is often a heart that's in rebellion. Let me put it this way. I am not a Formula One driver because I've never had a willingness to pursue the sport. Therefore, you can never attain what you don't want. Matthew 15, verses 8 and 9 say, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips. But their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Now, how many of us can be guilty of this? We can have lips that say all of these wonderful things to God when we want something. We have lips that can say these elaborate prayers, but when it comes down to the contents of our hearts, we really aren't willing to know the Lord. We are only seeking to benefit from his goodness and his blessings. And so when God finds a person who truly has a willing heart, he loves that. He loves a heart that's full of faith. A heart that's committed and focused to seek his kingdom first, above all else. Have you ever sprayed a water bottle? Next time you do, look at the water that comes out. It's a mist. It's here one second, gone the next. The truth is that our lives are the same way. We're here one second, then gone the next. Since life is so short, we need to submit to and obey the words of Christ. The book of Ecclesiastes has much to say about the brevity of life. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 2 says, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. This word for vanity is the Hebrew word habel. Habel can be translated as vanity or transitory. One minute we're here, then the next we're gone. Many scholars believe that the author of the book of Ecclesiastes is a king named Solomon. If there was ever a person who had it all, It was Solomon. Now, Ecclesiastes 2, verse 1 in the Amplified Translation says, I said to myself, Come now, I will test you with pleasure and gratification. So enjoy yourself and have a good time. But behold, this too was vanity, futility, meaninglessness. At the time, Solomon was known as the wisest man on earth. People would travel from great distances just to see him. When it came to wealth, he far surpassed anyone at the time. He was as wealthy as Bill Gates is now. When it came to sexual pleasure, 
He had far more than any man could handle. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. He had every earthly desire a person could want, yet at the end of his life, he realized that it all mattered not. He was going to die and leave all that he had accumulated. The same is true for us today. When we get to the end of our life, it will not matter how great of a position we had at work, how much money we have, or how lovely our house is. Almost everything we own will end up in a garage sale or a trash dump. What will matter is if we listen and submit to the words of Christ. Solomon tried the same thing. Ecclesiastes 2, 4-6 says, I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. Solomon had many more resources than you and I. However, his houses, vineyards, gardens, and parks are no longer standing. The wealth he had? He lost the day he died. And eventually, all that we have will not be left standing. Maybe we pivot by saying that we'll leave a legacy instead of accumulating wealth. There is some goodness in leaving a legacy. However, that legacy will die as well. Do you know who your great-great-grandparents are? Probably not, and that was not very long ago. Your great-great-grandkids will probably not know you. Even if you become famous, people may remember your name, but they do not truly know who you are. Many think they can live the life they want now and submit to God later. You may think you will have more time later. However, you don't know how much time you actually have left on earth. Remember, life is a mist. It's here one second and gone the next. Due to that, we need to live with urgency. Tomorrow is never promised. If you hear Christ knocking on your heart, now is the time to listen. The promise in the Bible is actually not for tomorrow, but today. In the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 34, Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Jesus tells us not to worry about tomorrow. We're not even guaranteed we will see tomorrow. Instead, focus on your relationship with God today. You have a chance to repent and turn to God at this very moment. You may say to yourself, I will turn from my sin later when I get a little older or more financially secure. God is calling you to repent now. Once, a family was sitting outside on their porch, watching a storm come rolling in. The rain was heavy and the wind even heavier. Suddenly, they heard the tornado sirens go off. Four out of the five family members ran to the basement to hide. The father decided to keep watching the storm. His family yelled for him to come down to the basement for protection. He said he would, but he wanted to wait a while longer until the storm got a little more dangerous. The rest of the family did all they could to get him to the basement, but nothing worked. Eventually, a funnel cloud dropped down from the sky right on top of their house. After the tornado ripped through, the family in the basement was safe. However, the father did not survive as the tornado threw him a thousand feet through the air. Many of us are like this father. We're waiting for just the right time to repent. Maybe we have some sort of sexual sin we want to hold on to. We may have a sinful habit that we don't want to let go, or maybe we're in a relationship we know we should not be. We're waiting for just the right moment to repent. You may be waiting just long enough to enjoy your sin as much as possible, but not too long so you will not carry it into death. The truth is, we don't know how long we've got. Life is transitory. 
here one second, gone the next. We have very little control over when that will happen. In light of that, we need to repent now. We need to repent before the storm comes and sweeps us away. There must come a time when you, as a believer, must decide. I will stand strong and follow the word of God, regardless of what I will have to give up and who I will have to let go of. There comes a time when you have to decide. I will stand and do the godly thing. I will forgive even when it's hard to do. Even when I've been hurt. There will come a time when you will have to decide to stand in faith. Even when you can't see a way out of the situation that you're in. Now today, you may be under attack in some area of your life. You have tried everything to resolve it. But nothing is working. Nothing is changing. Dear friend, this is the time you ought to take a stand and believe. Believe in the power of the blood of Jesus. It will break you out of that bondage. Believe in the power that's in the blood of Jesus Christ. It can set you free. It can give you victory and it can loose you from any evil hold. It's time to take a stand with the word of God against the forces of evil. Stand firm, stand in confidence, stand in righteousness. Psalm 56 verse three says, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. In God whose word I praise, In God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? We need to be men and women who put their trust in the Lord. And mind you, you will only ever be able to stand firm when your trust is secured in the Lord. So if you feel stuck, if you feel under attack, remember that the Bible says in Psalm 31, Verse 24, be strong and let your heart take courage, all you who wait for the Lord. Be strong, saints, and stand in faith. As you do this, the Lord is sure to rescue you. And so as children of God, I believe, I believe that it's time to stand. Stand up and lift high his royal banner. You are an ambassador of the Most High. Stand up to the lies of the enemy. Stand up with the truth of the gospel. Stand up with the strength of the Holy Spirit. Stand up in God's strength. And I encourage you, as you stand in faith, pray and ask the Lord to be with you as you stand. If I can be honest, and speak from the heart. I haven't always been saved. I haven't always been the good, strong Christian that some may have thought me to be. I can admit to struggling. Did I love my neighbors as I love myself? Not all the time, because it's hard. It's hard to turn the other cheek. It's hard to be a peacemaker when there are people who test you. It's hard to love all your neighbors because quite simply, not everyone is a nice person. Not everyone is easy to love. And you know what else is hard? Living a life focused on Christ in a world that offers so many glittery distractions. But here's what I want you to know. Have I found it difficult to live right? Yes. Have I struggled with finding the discipline to pray on a daily basis? Yes. Has there been a day that went by when I didn't open my Bible? Of course. But here's what I found. As I reflected on my walk with God, I realized that the reason for my struggles 
The thing that has caused me to have such a tough time is the fact that I've been so reliant on my own strength. I've tried to do things on my own, but by myself, of course, I would find it hard to be at peace with all men, especially when they do me wrong. But if I pray for grace, if I allow the Holy Spirit to operate freely within me, I have the strength to let things go. I'm not going to be bothered by the petty things. Not everything done to me is worth me getting upset about. By myself, it's hard to live a life focused on Christ in a world that offers so many glittery distractions. But if I pray for strength, if I admit my shortcomings, then His grace is sufficient for me. God's power is made perfect in my weakness. By myself, I just have too many limitations. I have emotions that mislead me. I have feelings that tempt me. I have thoughts that cloud my judgment. This is why you shouldn't try and rely on your own power and might. Because we all will fall short eventually if we try and do things on our own. So you may be in a position where, like me, you're struggling to do the work of God, to live righteously, to live a life pleasing to God. Well, I'd like to tell you to start calling on the strength of God, because on your own, you'll never be able to win this battle against the devil. You need the power, the wonder-working power that's in the blood of Jesus. You need the power from the Holy Spirit, because the Bible says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes up on you. Jesus said that because he knew. He knew that we would find it difficult to face life with our own strength. We're limited in our wisdom, in our knowledge. So we need the power and might that comes when we receive the Holy Ghost. Hear me when I say, that we can and we should live by the power that's in the name of Jesus. Now the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 9, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. And so what that means for us is that when it's hard, when it's difficult, and we feel weak, that is when we should call on the power that's in the name of Jesus, the name above every other name. Tough times and difficulties can be a blessing for each of us as children of God. I say this because if you look throughout the Bible, many people have found themselves in troubling situations only for God to use those troubles to remind us that He is a great deliverer. He is a God who saves. And this should give us hope. This should give us peace and joy that we are not alone when tough times come into our lives. We are not forsaken. You see, we love to recite Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. But when the Bible tells us that Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. We forget that the valley is still a place that we need to walk through. Yes, the Lord is my shepherd. Yes, he will supply all of my needs and make me to lie down in green pastures. But there is still a valley for me to go through. And the thing about valleys is that Valleys for a child of God are not an accident or some sort of mistake. Your time is in fact ordered by the Lord. There is a purpose for your time in the valley. We must recognize that Christ has already won. We must realize His resurrection power is available to us as His children. We must release our lives to the leadership, to the counsel of the Holy Spirit, and we must continue to stand firm in the Word of God.